step What can figure it out That's how it chooses you Hello! Hey, Claire! Welcome to Smidgen, everybody! It chooses you, Smidgen edition, Smidge a dish. This is my song. It is freaking brilliant. <laughs> it's a very good song. Did you, you wrote that, right? That's you? <laughs> Claire Patton original? Yeah, I hate to brag, but it, when it first came up, it was like in the moment. Like, oh, really? Wow. You never know. <laughs> you never know. Lyrical genius, me. You are. You completely <laughs> captured the energy of that. Good job. <laughs> yes, our smidgen edition this week is brought to you by the lovely Claire Patton. That's me. And that's Teresa Sparks, my partner in crime over here. Hello. Partner in crime is the best epithet I've ever had. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I have a movie recommendation. Oh, yeah? I guess it's for everybody. <laughs> I suppose you guys can watch it, too, if you want. There's a movie that just was released on Amazon Prime <laughs> called Attack the Block. Okay. I don't know it. It's a 2011 action film. It stars a very young John Boyega okay. as the leader of a group of friends from the projects in South London. Okay. They're small-time criminals who have to defend their neighborhood from an alien invasion. Yes. Is it a metaphor for gentrification? I think it might be. Cool. It folds in the social justice pieces brilliantly. Yeah. Jodie Whittaker and Nick Frost are also Come in the on. film. It won all kinds of awards, and it's executive produced by Edgar Wright. So, clearly. Great recommendation. Attack the block. Let's go. Yeah. They classify it as action comedy. There are some very funny moments, but it has some heft to it. Okay. And I feel like it is not only a seamless integration of the social justice themes that are, let's face it, a part of everyday life, but also models white behavior and shows different sides of existence with compassion. Cool. Yes, I I very much enjoy um, cinematic representations of white behavior. It's so hard to see ourselves. And it's so useful. There's lots of in it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just think that's one. Uh, there's lots of in it. Yeah. <laughs> that's all I've got. That's the only slang I recognize. In it. It's my favorite British slang. Mm -hmm. I remember teasing Gemma, our friend Gemma, who is from London. And I asked her some question. <laughs> I asked her some question about the circumstances of her childhood. And the question I asked was very much from my own perspective growing up in a relatively small town in West Virginia. And she kind of looked at me. She's like, yeah, I grew up in London, though. And I was like, oh, shit, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't really know that. Because <laughs> when she said she, I picture smaller towns, you know, I watch a lot of Austin adaptations and they all live in villages. You guys, I forgot London was a thing. She is... A brilliant artist and such a classy per just a class act. Yes. I think I said this at one point on the podcast, but it was <laughs> I was I was talking about something and I was like, oh, it's like she gets off on emotionally connecting with people. <laughs> and you looked at me like I was a fucking moron alien and I was like, Oh right, we want that. I get it. I'm sorry. No, I'm I'm on the same page now. I got it. Because she's a wonderful person who connects with other people and she's very good at it and very sincere and you know. I was like, Ugh, I just can't handle how much better she is than me. I love hard Teresa. I consider that. Is, is that hard Teresa in your file? That's alien Teresa in mine. It's like, oh, I accidentally displayed that I'm not from here. Sorry. It's hard Teresa in my mind, but only because you're not really like that. It's like a pers it, it's like a persona you have on occasion. <laughs> like if you were really like that, I think I don't think we'd really be friends. Yeah. But it's because you slip into this persona. You can call it an alien or hard Teresa, whatever you want. But it's like you forget. <laughs> where we are. <laughs> oh, right. No, human connection is the whole reason we exist. I'm sorry. I momentarily forgot that and slipped into this other thing. Sorry. I'm back now. So what are we going to smidge about today? We're smidging on the new girl character, Nick Miller. Oh, I mean, I think this morning I'm more in a Winston mood, but I am so ready to talk about <laughs> Nick Miller. Okay. I have this thing I do, and it's rare. But sometimes when I'm watching a television show or a movie, a character will do something and I'll chuckle to myself and say, you idiot. <laughs> now, when I do that, it means that the moronic behavior of the character was so compelling that it made me recognize my own inner moron. Mm. And that recognition made me laugh. Mm. It is a compliment of the highest order. Okay. <laughs> so I want to give that context. I love idiots. Yeah. And Nick Miller is an idiot 
unparalleled. Yeah. <laughs> he is just my favorite idiot. <laughs> Don't moonwalk out of here. Don't moonwalk out of here. <laughs> Nick Miller is played by Jake Johnson brilliantly, and his performance is a great part of why I love him. But when talking about the origins of a character, I feel it's important to also give credit to the writers who obviously have a major role in who a character is. So a shout out to Elizabeth Merriweather, the creator of New Girl. The show lasted for seven seasons, so I can't really name all of the writers, but I do want to give some big credit to the head writers of my three favorite Nick Miller episodes that we will be discussing today. Okay. And those people are J.J. Philbin, Nick Adams, Kim Rosenstock, and just in general, big, big kudos and love to all the writers that worked on that show because it's brilliantly written. Yes, I agree. Structurally, we're just going to address three episodes, but I'm sure lots will become unlocked. Nick Miller is the loser we're all afraid we are, and we love him for it. Yeah. The first episode I want to discuss is Fancy Man Part 1. Okay. Which I believe is season two. Don't quote me on that. Fancy Man Part 1 is the perfect example of the way Nick Miller has strong convictions, but he abandons them so easily. <laughs> To great comic effect. In Fancy Man Part 1, what's happened is Jessica Day, played by Zoe Deschanel, is dealing with a parent from her school. That parent is very wealthy, and it's played by Dermot Moroni. So she's basically got to go to a party at his house. And she decides to bring Nick Miller along because (laughs) Nick Miller hates rich people. Jessica Day can kind of feel herself being reeled in by this man and his wealth. So she's she needs a buffer. She needs someone to keep her. An anchor. Yeah, she needs an anchor. And that's Nick Miller. I should also say the episode begins with Nick Miller unable to get a cell phone because he has a 250 credit score. Oh, and so he he decides he decides that not having a phone is going to be his thing. <laughs> I, yep. Nick is a bartender and he's grown up working class, and he's very much a class warrior. I identify with that a lot. So he goes to the party with Jessica Day, you know, and she he says he says something, this isn't a quote, but he says something like, look at this hallway. It's so pretentious. It literally just serves to convey you from one room to another. And he says, this place is so pretentious. Right. So the two of them walk in and sort of have this, uh, they're just making fun of everything. This house is ridiculous. It's a mansion. It's overblown. This is, but then they walk into Dermot Mulroney's study. Mm. And it's a very typical wealthy man study with a beautiful mahogany table, a leather chair, wildlife prints, and a wooden duck, and leather bound books. Nick Miller loses his mind because he's got this sort of Hemingway vision of wealth plus masculinity that just inspires him. And so he suddenly switches on a dime. Yes. If anything can make one do that is the combination of mahogany and leather. And eventually he he meets Dermot Mulroney. He's sitting in Dermot Mulroney's chair wearing his sweater, his cable knit <laughs> sweater, right? Maroon, of course, perfect color. He he basically tells Dermot Mulroney he doesn't have a phone and he hands him this beautiful brand new cell phone that he just had extra. And Nick Miller's like, I don't want it. I know. And he touches it and he says, is it possible to be sexually attracted to an object? (laughs) Dermot Mulroney says, yes. He said, I'm sorry I'm here, but I just came in here and it smelled like Shakespeare. If Shakespeare were a damn cowboy. Perfectly Nick Miller line. He must have been so fun to write for. He really must have been. I do want to mention there's a show called The Writer's Room that used to be on Netflix. It's now on Amazon Prime. You can buy it. They're, I think, $2 an episode. It's just a short, I believe it's half hour to an hour show where they talk to writing teams from different television shows. And New Girl is one of them. And it's Elizabeth Merriweather and a couple of other writers from the show and also Jake Johnson. So if anyone's interested in getting a more distinct view of the creative process behind the show, that's definitely worthwhile. Nice. The other episode I really love is Menzies. Okay. For anyone in the know, this is the episode in which Nick Miller meets Tran. The most amazing friendship ever depicted on screen. (laughs) The bromance to end all bromances. Promise is that basically just his roommates are driving him crazy. He wants to get out of the house, so he goes to the park. And and this episode, to me, is another piece that I really relate to, which is Nick Miller's anger. Mm. He goes to the park and... An old man sits down next to him wearing a blue hat, just a plain blue hat, sits very close and 
Nick's initially like, no, I don't. You got to go somewhere else. I don't. And the man just looks at him smiling, just very sweet smile and never says anything. And Nick just processes everything that's going on with him to this man sitting there, this very sweet, but, you know, immovable man. Right. Well, and blank, right? No change in facial expression, no contribution to the conversation. Like, he just reflects. He's mm -hmm. just a mirror for Nick to look, peer into. And, you know, he comes up with all kinds of stuff. Like, he said, you know, I hate my roommates. Okay, fine. I don't hate my roommates. I hate myself. Is that what you want me to say? <laughs> so he just really realizes a lot. <laughs> and, and I've had relationships like that, especially living in and around Boulder, that you meet a lot of people who, st who study Buddhism or maybe meditation or just have that ethos of just reflecting to you. And you do end up confessing a lot to them and sort of processing a lot just through their presence. <laughs> yeah. The thing I love about Nick's relationship with Tran is that it's an ongoing plot line. They don't drop it. It's, it's an arc that develops over the course of, I think, a couple of seasons. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really wonderful, this unlikely friendship where... Like they, these two don't seem to have a lot in common, but they really connect. And they connect in a way that's not typical for those of us who are verbal first, right? Because <laughs> Nick is just like vomit, vomit, vomit. Tran says nothing, and and then Nick's like, okay, well that's enough vomit. What else is here now? I vomited enough that I can actually see what's going on. Okay, fine. I don't hate my roommates. I hate myself. Is that what you want to hear? Mm hmm. <laughs> There's also, I don't know what episode it's from, but there's a great moment where Nick does a burpee. Mm -hmm. I've seen it. <laughs> I remember it so well. I remember it every time I do a burpee. I'm like, at least I'm doing it better than Nick. It's maybe my favorite thing. My one favorite thing in the entire show. It, and it's, it's just, again, that laziness, that sort of loser side. I really... I just relate to it. Mm -hmm. The final episode I wanted to talk about is the episode Pepperwood, in which we really see Nick's misguided loyalty and his paranoia. So he's a, you know, he can be a very good friend, of course, you know, he's got to be relatable. It's ultimately got to be the kind of person you would enjoy hanging out with. And in that episode, Jessica Day is teaching adults how to write, and one of her students has written some really graphic sort of murder literature mm -hmm. talking about killing a deer and her big eyes, which basically, through a series of events, convinces Nick that her student is a, a serial killer and is going to kill Jessica. So he takes on a an alternate identity as Julius Pepperwood from Chicago to surveil this guy and make sure he's not up to anything. And it just shenanigans ensue. And that's an especially good Nick and Jessica episode. He's just a good one. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I love him because he's <laughs> like, he's such a child. And like, he tries to be sneaky and fails. Like he's trying to not be seen, but he's being so obvious. Like he's, he's trying to not be seen and he desires attention in equal measure somehow. Mm. And that's what attracts me to him because I'm like, oh, yeah, I know that one. Mm -hmm. And if he's called out on something, he reacts the way a child does. When a child is, hey, you know, I saw maybe you did this. And he, and he basically throws a tantrum that his bad behavior has been witnessed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and instead of like, I and I love that. It's so relatable, right? Because we want to say, no, 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 you misunderstood. And that's not what happened. And this is what's really going on. And you don't know me. And rah, 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 rah. And the wonderful thing about him is eventually he's like, yeah, okay, that's what, you know, he admits it eventually. He grow like, he grows up in every episode. It's like, it's, he really does. He's like the riddle guy. He's like a baby in the morning and he's an adult in the afternoon and he's an old man in the evening. Like, mm -hmm. he's the Sphinx riddle personified. It, this is really true. And I think that's important for writing is that the characters grow. They can, they, they can go back to one in the next episode. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, and it's not like we grow up and stop doing all of our nonsense and just like a hard cut off. Now I don't do that anymore. That stuff is always an option. <laughs> like, totally. <laughs> I lived my life that way for 15 years. You think that's not in my back pocket? Should I need it again? It's definitely there. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Those coping mechanisms don't just disappear one day. <laughs> that's right. Even if your situation is entirely different, somehow, uh, the, yeah, the coping mechanism that you developed to deal with most likely your family situation stays with you even when your family situation changes. Isn't that fun? Yeah. <laughs> I always have this desire to embrace my inner idiot. Yeah. 
but it's really hard for me. I don't want, there's also part of me that doesn't want to be thought of as an idiot yeah, or as someone who make, makes mistakes, right? We have a, we, a lot of us have this drive to perfectionism. And so I think Nick Miller does something really wonderful in that he carries our failings for us. And that's really hard work. It is. Yes. <laughs> and you watch him struggle and it, oh, thank God you're doing it because I can't today. I mean, maybe he does lift the burden a little bit for for some of us. <laughs> yeah. Or, I mean, at the, at the very least, if you're interested in growing, you know, and learning different ways than you know now, being able to see it in action, it's like, oh, shit, I do that and it might actually look like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> right. Okay. And so he becomes a mirror for us the way Tran is for him. Yeah. That's what I look like. That's how I... That's how I treat my friends when that happens. Oh, God. Okay. I don't want to do that. So, and being able to say, I'm sorry, I just Nick Millard you. My bad. Right. Let me try that again. <laughs> so, inspired by Nick Miller, I I will continue to work to embrace my inner idiot. That's my intention. <laughs> well, they're not going anywhere. It's not like you can ever get rid of the inner idiot. It's always there. So, you might as well love it, right? Love your inner idiot, everybody. Thank you, Nick Miller. Thank you, Nick Miller. We love you. Have a great week. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Testing. Great. Thank you for listening to It Chooses You. Your hosts are Teresa Sparks and Claire Patton. Our theme song is by Bobby Dart. If you'd like to get in touch with us, drop us an email at itchoosesyoupodcast at gmail.com. <laughs>